At that time, I delivered a presentation on creek removal in the Cherokee country. What I tried to point out was that essentially these two removals are much more connected than people realized. And there were two to three thousand creeks, I believe, who took to the Cherokee country when things got bad in Alabama. And really the first troops that entered uh, the Cherokee country, people we heard about yesterday in 1836, came here after creeks to remove them first. And that sort of laid the groundwork where they learned the country, uh, they built some of the posts, they learned what roads they could use, build new roads, laid the groundwork for Cherokee removal. So they, these things were kind of connected. And a lot of these creeks were removed by way of Gunnersville Landing. I think some of them rode on the railroad uh, that we talked about yesterday when uh, some of the Cherokees were being removed. But I got to all of that by way of researching this book on the Second Creek War, which was the war that facilitated creek removal. When this war broke out, a rebellion of some of the Lower Creek tribes people, then it gave the government an excuse to break all their treaties and just sweep all of the creeks out, even the upper creeks who were fairly friendly and even helped the American troops, sweep them all out as a national security measure. But still, you know, there were creeks in the Cherokee country and won't, won't leave until the final removals of 38 with some of the Cherokees. So the two are connected. But, uh, this Second Creek War had never been written about. It was kind of a hidden conflict, and I was amazed at how long it went on and how involved it was and how much it had to tell us about the social history of the Georgia, Alabama, Florida area. But then I realized that the whole creek removal has been kind of hidden. I'm amazed at what you all have done and others have done to mark and commemorate recognize Cherokee removal with all these signs, with all these historical markers. There's nothing like that for creek removal, essentially, in Alabama. So what I tried to do is go around and get, uh, find some of these hidden sites of creek removal. They're not so hidden in the sense that nobody knows about them, but hardly anybody knows about them, and they are simply not marked. They're not remembered. So what I wanted to do was pick out some images from a few of these sites to tell you about, and then along the way I'll just try to connect back with Cherokee removal as we go. So creek removal hidden sites. Now this is a picture of Alabama as it existed in 1830, and you will see here it says Indian lands, that's the Creek Nation, but also to the north there are some of the Cherokee lands in Alabama. They were contiguous there. The other part is called Old Alabama, and those were the Alabama ca counties that were in existence. Now here's another map of my own creation that shows Old Alabama, the state part of the state was created in 1819, and then in the 1830s there's New Alabama or the Old Creek Nation. What happened was it was a, a, a thing called the Caseta Treaty, or Caseta as they say it in Alabama of 1832, which uh, gave the Creeks an option. They could remove west or they could take individual family land allotments in Alabama and they could stay. They could sort of renounce their Creek citizenship and become citizens of the state of Alabama, but stay. They didn't have to remove. It gave them the option. It gave them the choice. Well, there's going to be a lot of land speculation. There's going to be a lot of fraud. Ultimately, some of the starving lower creeks will, uh, I'll show you a map that relates to this a little later, will rebel. They sweep all of them out. So it becomes a removal treaty, even though for the creeks they didn't intend that. But it was called, uh, then the, the state of Alabama also started to extend its laws into the Creek country in 1832. And at that point, it became known as New Alabama, as opposed to Old Alabama that had been in existence in 1819. And there were nine counties, Barber, Russell, Macon, Chambers, uh, so on up to Benton County. And then, of course, the Cherokees were above them. The Chickasaw still have some land in Alabama, uh, and so on. And so we'll look at some of the established uh, Anglo communities, Montgomery, Salem, Mobile, Tuscaloosa was the capital of the state in those days. 
Now, this is simply what you just saw, but it's encapsulated in the part of the Creek Nation where this Creek War and removals actually were concentrated. Uh, this territory between Columbus, Georgia, and over to the old Alabama line. This is some of the uh, Creek towns as well as some of the settler <coughs> communities there. The Federal Road, this is an important highway through the region, the Federal Road, and then in 1836, something called the New Road, connecting Columbus with Tus Tuskegee and then joining with the old Federal Road was created. Those are important highways in terms of the war and creek removal. Fort Mitchell we'll look at first of all, and Fort Mitchell, let's see if we go back, Fort Mitchell was right here, close to the Chattahoochee River. That was the, basically the only central army post in New Alabama at the time. Very important in terms of the war and removal. But look here. If you see there on the bottom sentence, 1836, Lower Creek's Corral here for force removal to the west. You know everything, all of the uh, historical markers you folks interested in the Cherokees have that mention removal. That's one of the few or only ones in the whole state of Alabama that says anything about removal. And even that, if you go through the museum at Fort Mitchell, it does not tell how it was a removal camp, what was done there. It, there's no mention of the Second Creek War or the Creek War of 1836 that surrounded this post. And in fact, this post, if you see pictures here, these are some photographs I took of it, has a stockade. The letters I read from 1836 say it didn't even have a stockade until 1836. But they're saying that from the very beginning, when the first Creek War, back in 1813-14, it existed in this form or fashion. So there's just a lot about even the established historical sites in Alabama regarding the Creek Indians and removal that are not presented correctly, if at all. So Fort Mitchell, uh, one of these kind of hidden sites. It's not hidden, it's in plain view, but the, it, the, the knowledge about removal in the Creek War is all essentially hidden there. Uh, they have created a native stickball field at Fort Mitchell, though. I'm not exactly sure why. There was, a, I guess, a move to hope to have the Creeks come visit there, come, you know, reestablish some of their cultural events like stickball and all the rest. But uh, So there is com some commemoration of the Creeks and their culture there. But again, the war and removal, if this had been a, a Cherokee site that was had the same significance in for Cherokee removal, you would see signs and markers and videos and everything all over the place. Now, Fort Cusita in Chambers County. This, uh, as you can see here, they're calling this the last known fort of the kind in the southeast. It was one of these small stockades that was created during the Creek, Second Creek War. They existed all over the new Alabama counties, or the counties of the old Creek Nation. This is the only one left in existence, and it's crumbling, which shows you what little attention there has been to to historic res restoration and, pre and preservation of some of these sites. Here's some other. Uh, the Cedar, right up here, you see it in Chambers, that's what would be Chambers County. It's just to the left of uh, Tuckabatchee Harjo's town. Tuckabatchee Harjo was an important uh, Casita uh, chief, uh, actually, him staying out of the rebellion of the Lower Creeks probably doomed the Lower Creek Bayon to, to, to failure. But anyway, there actually, what I'm trying to say, there wasn't any really need for that stockade. It was built out of fear, but it, it's, it's all we have left by way of material culture of this, uh, this Creek Wars, this little fort. Uh, they built this shed around it in the last few years, and now the shed's crumbling down. In fact, the walls of the fort are collapsing, and they're taking down the shed. And as far as I know, there's not very much being done to preserve this site. 
much less commemorate it, look at the uh, historical marker. There is no mention here of removal. There's no mention of the Second Creek War, which was the larger context in which this fort was built. You know, you just don't get much of the story. And I'm not sure that that last statement is true. It's the last known fort of its kind in the southeast. I lived in East Tennessee, and it seemed to me there were three or four such things there. You know how to get a bird, don't you? What? You know how to get a bird, don't you? I don't. I haven't. Put go out of that one side up, and I guarantee you stay there. <laughs> well, I don't know. That's Auburn country. How <laughs> come <laughs> bird? Well, I see what you mean. Yeah, connect it with football in some way, it'll get better, right? This is the back end of this little fort. Oh. Now imagine, again, if you had an existent structure around here that had something to do with creek removal, do you think it would be in that condition? I mean, excuse me, with Cherokee removal? Probably not. Uh, you can see the inside. That wall looks pretty good and still. Are you sure of this history? The casita was on the Chattahoochee, and your map suggests that this is quite a ways. Casita, as, a, as the major town, didn't exist in 36. The, the people had already scattered out into smaller towns. And the actual, when you say casita there, that's the white settlement. And Echo Harjo's town nearby which I'm not sure was, it may have still been called Casita, but it was the major uh, Casita settlement. But they, they've scattered. The main Casita site is below Fort Mitchell on the Chattahoochee. And that's what, one thing we're doing at Columbus State University, where I'm trying to institute a we, we program to, uh, to uh, locate some of these sites and put them on a, a bigger map that can be seen from our school website. So, and you know, and it'll have video and it will have some documentation uh, presentation. Now, we move over to Tallahassee. Uh, Tallahassee, and this is again the white settlement of Tallahassee that was created during the removal days. Uh, you can see here it's on the Tallapoosa River. You see Tallahassee. It is a uh, this town's still in existence, but it's an <coughs> important creek removal site. Uh, Tallahassee is one of the places where the major towns on the Tallapoosa River congregated their people before the move west in the fall, early fall, late summer of 1836. And this would have included the Tuckabatches with the Pafla Yahola, who was this speaker of the upper creeks and really the major creek leader of the day that's where he and his people left from but again you can search all through the town of Tallahassee no mention of creek removal now the folks are interested in creek history but it all seems to be concentrated in a earlier time you have a picture of the other side of that marker no it's just the same Oh, it, on the other side. oh, it did? Yeah. Okay, no, I didn't miss that. I thought they're normally just repeated. Okay, I'll take a look at that. This is overlooking the town of Tallahassee. Many of these important creek towns are at the fall line, and uh, Tallahassee was located at the falls of the Tallapoosa River. So you can kind of overlook and imagine what it was like. Uh, when the creeks lived there, when the creek camp was established, but again, there's no mention of where this camp actually was, although it would have housed, contained several thousand people. Now, I found this interesting in downtown Tallahassee. The Historical Society, and they have since put on this play called Tecumseh at Tuckabatchee. Now, People are very interested in Creek history of a sort, particularly of the early period around the First Creek War. Uh, Tecumseh came and visited Tuckabatchee. Tuckabatchee was on the Tallapoosa somewhat south of Tallahassee, the town you've just seen. And, uh, you know, that's an event that's kind of well documented by historians. So they're, they're concerned about their Native American past, but it's, it's of a sort. It's the First Creek War. Removal, Second Creek War, it's just this great open 
vacuum where nobody knows much about it. Now this is a little church that's located right close to the site of Tuckabatchee. Tuckabatchee is important because it was the major Creek town, certainly the major upper Creek town, and probably the most uh, influential town of all the Creeks. Apothle Yola lived, this dead man that I've talked about. This is a few miles south. There's no historical marker here. There used to be one in the old days, but it's something has happened to it. And I think maybe the Alabama Historical Commission, concerned about pot hunting and everything, shies away from, from documenting some of these sites on the major rivers. But you still could put something out. There's a major highway close by. There's Highway 85, uh, interstate, runs close by. You could say you could do something, you know to talk about the significance of Tuckabatchee, removal, something, but it's just this blank. What was the population of uh, Tuckabatchee you know, when were, uh, the creeks were thriving? And yeah, it, I'm, I'm not really sure to tell you the truth. There, uh, the creeks, you know, the, the towns have, had all kind of disintegrated. The people were living all over. They had followed the creeks out from the main rivers. I mean, the, the creeks as waterways. Uh, I wouldn't think that it would be a thousand people, but something close to that. And did they have the townhouse structure? Yeah, they, have, they would have that, but sometimes you would see these things existing sort of in isolation, and people would come there at times of the busk or for other ceremonies. Yeah. But otherwise, the towns would seem sort of deserted, seem sort of empty. People are living out. Uh, Tuckabatchee. Uh, see, right here follow the line up, you can see it was in the big bend of the Tallapoosa River before it sort of flowed on to join the Coosa before the Alabama River. And again, a few miles below Tallahassee. Isn't there some kind of mark right down there, 85, some significant town that's in Creek? I drive that way pretty regularly and I haven't seen it. That doesn't mean that it's not there, but. <clears throat> now, Wetumpka, Wetumpka, Alabama. Over here on the Coosa River, the creeks live primarily along the Coosa, the Tallapoosa, and over here, the uh, Chattahoochee. Upper Creek's up here, Lower Creek's down here. There's Wetumpka. Very important removal site. Again, no markers, no nothing. We don't really know, you know, in, in terms of public history, very much about Wetumpka as a removal site. Here's the bridge over the Coosa River at Tecumseh. It's a pretty place. Again, you can imagine what the Creeks would have seen, what they would experience before they left for the West as they accumulated in another large removal camp at Wetumpka. Now, the uh, porch band of creeks located on the Florida-Alabama line do have some land there, and they have one of their bingo establishments. And so you do see this note of, you know, notice of Creek Indians, but again, it's modern, it's contemporary, it's right now. Talladega, Alabama. Um, now this is important in terms of you all who are very, most particularly interested in Cherokee removal. Talladega is the name with border town. Some people say, well, because it was bordered the creeks with the Notches or the Notche, but I think it's probably because it's close to the Cherokee border. A lot of these people from the Talladega region, you can see some of these, uh, Arbacucci and other, other Creek towns there, they had fairly close relationships with the Creeks, I mean, excuse me, with the Cherokees. And it's from this district in the northern part of the Creek country that so many people, when times came hard, when settlers started coming in after the 1832 Casita Treaty, 
that they departed for the Cherokee country and tried to stay in the mountains. The Cherokees welcomed them, tried to help them as best they could. John Ross was petitioned by the government, you've got to help turn these people over. He said, no, it's a long established policy that we welcome each other, that we provide for each other. Uh, I have told them that they probably should remove, that they should obey the government, but I'm not going to force them to do so. So the Army had to search them out. Now, interestingly, though, there was some hostility between, amongst some Creeks because of this, because when they started the process of allotting Creek lands to individual families, some of the Creeks that had lived with the Cherokees since the first Creek War, 1813, 1814, came back to Alabama to get their land allotments. And this angered some of the other Creeks because it said, you left the nation, you departed, you haven't been here for 20 years, you haven't fulfilled your communal responsibilities, you haven't participated in the bus ceremonies, you haven't helped tend the communal fields. We don't consider you Creeks anymore in terms of getting your land allotments. And in some cases, they assaulted these Cherokee Creeks and ran them back to the Cherokee country. But, again, Talladega, you do see some historical marker, but it's all connected with the first Creek War when Andrew Jackson came to defeat the Red Sticks. You can find, you know, <clears throat> commemorations of that. Horseshoe Bend, the beautiful park, everything else. But again, Talladega, little said about the, the numbers of creeks that were removed from there in 1836. All right, Society Hill. This is something interesting to me. There was a main uh, kind of running short on time, but look. One of the interesting things and tragic things about this Second Creek War is that the federal government recruited a regiment, a battalion of Creek warriors to serve with, with the U.S. Army against the Seminoles. That army departed Alabama to fight against the Seminoles, and the agreement was our families can stay in removal camps until we finish our service in Florida we will come back to these removal camps, get them, and then we'll go west. Now, this is after the main body of Creeks has already left. There was tremendous problems in these camps. They were invaded by settlers, by roughs, by thugs, by thieves. There was rape. There was all this sort of stuff. The governor of Alabama took it on his own to take these people out, send them to Montgomery, put them on steamboats, send them to another removal camp down at Mobile Point, Alabama, just to stop the crimes and everything, the problems. Nobody knew where these camps were. You could find mention of them in the documents, but nobody today in Alabama knows very little or anything about them. So I went out and tried to find these places. Society Hill, it's on Highway 80 in Macon County, Alabama. Uh, you see this Echo Harjo settlement. Echo Harjo became very important during the war. He helped. He was a kind of a cultural mediator. He had good relations with the rebel lower creeks, but also with the whites, with the upper creeks. He sort of rises to prominence during the Second Creek War. I think H.O. Harjo's camp is right here at the site of Society Hill. Uh, there was also a ranger station there. They kept troops there some time after all the removals had cleared out to watch for Indians that might be straggling in the swamps in 1837-1838. All there is at Society Hill, these two structures. That's Society Hill, Alabama. And there's no historical marker there about all of the events that took place at H.O. Harjo's camp where these people were assembled for removal. White Oak Plantation around the big swamp in uh, Macon County. The big swamp was uh, been in this area between the Federal Road right in here. Huge accumulation of creeks assembled there during the road. <coughs> About nine miles of creek camps and small settlements around the Big Swamp. The Big Swamp is now a hunting camp 
16,000 acres. You can't get in there to find what's going on. And there's no marker of its significance in creek and removal history. It's just like much of Macon County, it's just vacant land. Absentee landowners, hunting camps. I went, I went from Auburn, where I live, down to the south end of Macon County, up to Tuskegee, a trip that took me about an hour. I saw six more cars. <laughs> And I keep thinking, we removed the Creek Indians for this, you know? But it used to be important part cotton country, and that's why this removal took place. Tuskegee, there was a Creek War Fort there. There was a removal prison camp. That's where they moved. They took them out of the major camps, put them in Tuskegee, take them to Montgomery, ship them down the Alabama River. This is the courthouse on the square. Probably the fort would have been in that vicinity. But again, no one knows, there's no markers, there's no memory. Loblaco, Jim Boy's town, Jim Boy was an influential creek. Loblaco is in Macon County below Tuskegee. It has an important history in removal. That's what remains of Loblaco right there. And I had to find that. Lop uh, means big fish. Follow the arrow, it's right here in Macon County. That's just another picture. It's at the headwaters of Loblaco Creek, which goes into Eufaba Creek. Eufaba is very important. Cotton field nearby. They still do grow some cotton over in the west end of Macon County. But a lot you see a lot of mansions, a lot of nice homes over there. It's kind of a suburb of Montgomery now. Polecat Springs on Highway 80. Polecat Springs. Right here. Very important removal camp. Uh, people from Flablaco and Eufaula and other places were there. Well, you see what, what there is. You see any historical markers? See any notes about what Polecat Springs was in the early history of whites or Native Americans? <laughs> That's Polecat Springs. That's Macon County. That's kind of a nice picture. But it kind of shows you what happened at Polecat Springs, a chimney. Montgomery, Alabama, a lot of these native uh, creeks were assembled at Montgomery, put on steamboats, and sent down the river to Mobile Point for a huge removal camp. But again, you go down on the, that's the Alabama River there, it's a huge cotton port. You go down there, you find, well, White House of the Confederacy. You'll find all you want about Confederate history, about civil rights history, Martin Luther King, and everything else. Any mention of creek removal? Not really. Here's Montgomery, right here. Actually, that's confusing. I don't know why that would be Montgomery. Oh, here's Montgomery. Right here on the outskirts, in old Alabama, on the Alabama River, which again is formed by the Coosa and Tallapoosa coming together. All right, Fort Morgan, Mobile Point, famous removal site. It was the last removal site in Alabama. This is where you accumulated all those people from the camps that were supposed to be able to stay in Alabama while their men served in the Seminole War. Uh, this has a Civil War history. It has other history that's commemorated there, creek removal. The creeks would lived in the sandy pine woods out beside the fort. Many of them died. It was a very unhealthy place. They're buried in the sands out there. The creeks wanted to get out of there. They thought the place was kind of cursed. They will move them at some point over to past Christiane, Mississippi, and then over to New Orleans and up. But <coughs> that's, there's no note. There's no markers. There's nothing. All right, there's that. 
Now this final, this is just by the by, Osceola's birthplace that I found off Highway 51 in Macon County, Alabama. Of course, he was known for his participation in Seminole resistance, Seminole war. But he was a Creek. He was a Tallahassee from Tallahassee Town. He was born in Macon County. And this is his birthplace. Is there a marker there? Jesse Owens, everybody else famous in Alabama history has a marker. Does anybody know that Osceola was born there? Where? No. Uh, this area, someplace where you see uh, red Tuskegee or native Tuskegee, in that area is where Osceola would have been born. You have to walk a railroad track to get to where he's born, which is against the law because that's trust plat passing. Uh, right here on uh, Eufaba Creek, this is where he would have played as a little kid. His house is where his cabin was, was very close to this bridge. You look down, he would have taken a swim, a bath right there, no doubt, because it was so close to where his cabin was. But again, any indications? Imagine if this had been a famous Cherokee, you know? We would know this stuff. There would be a marker. There'd be memory. There'd be a conference. When did the Seminoles come into existence? What? When did the Seminoles come into existence? Well, in the 1700s, you know, they were splinter groups. Uh, related to the creeks that drifted by the by into Florida for reasons, all kinds of reasons, to get away from Anglo encroachment, to get away from problems with the Creek Confederacy. And uh, over time, sort of, were forced together to look something like a, a native nation through it, you know, ethnogenesis. Yes, sir? You, you may not know the answer to this question, but. Why is there such a disparity between the remembrance of Cherokee removal versus the remembrance of Creek removal? That's a great question. Uh, I think the Cherokees had better press. I think they did mm -hmm. more to popularize their cause, particularly in the North. Uh, there were more Cherokees that were acculturated and could do this. Also, the Creeks were quite conservative, and I think just the nature of the war and removal, it swept everything away. I mean, I think it even swept away white memory, because so many of the whites involved in the Creek war and removal then went west, and they took those memories with them, and they were, a new population filled in the next year. So if you two years after the war and removal, you approach somebody in Alabama and says, tell me something about the war and removal, they said, well, I wasn't here. I just got here. It was kind of a sweeping away of memory and everything else. But I do think the Cherokees just, they were just made themselves better known. Do you think the written language and the publication of things came out there a lot? No doubt. Yeah. When was their written language with the uh, Well, I don't know that they ever came up with a syllabary or language. I think the missionaries, uh, Dr. Green might know more about this, but I think that was provided for them at the time. Do you think the, for lack of other word, apathy toward um, remembering the Greek? Do you think it's on the state of Alabama? Do you think it's on the Greek nation? Well, uh, I'm not, I haven't been in, in contact enough with the Greek nation to know that. But I'm sure, certainly, Alabama should have done a better job. But again, I think the record was kind of covered over. You know, I think this war and removal was purposefully kind of expunged from the record. And like I say, there was not a lot of people to pass the memory along. So part of it is, is historical, but people have to be made aware of these things. And that's what I would hope to do now in Alabama so this process, you know, can, can sort of get kicked in. Although there are some people there that are Yes, ma'am. What? Are you Greek? Oh, no. 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 Some sort of German thing. <laughs> <laughs> Although my folks have lived in the South since 1750, so over that period of time, we probably canned everything that ever walked, crawled, or flew across the South. You know how people are. Yes, sir. That crumbling building that's under the shed, who owns that? And 
Is there any hope of getting that? Well, I think it's on railroad property. It is right up against uh, the tracks. The same tracks, by the way, that ran over Osceola's cabin, although it's miles and miles away. Did Joyce, Joyce Bear come and talk to you in? I've talked to her a couple of times, and in fact, the last time that I spoke to you all at one of these conferences, she was there. Now, and that's interesting, too, because she claims descent from Lochapoca Town, which is also, in those days, was in Macon County, and it was one of the Rebel Creek towns. I heard she said she was the boss. Yeah. Um, ignorance here. I've seen some references to Porch Creek. Yeah. Porch Creek, what are that? The Porch Creeks are a recognized creek community again, close to Atmore, Alabama, during the South. And they come at a sort of an early date. I won't say withdrew from the Creek Nation, but they formed their own community in a place away from some of the other important Creek towns um, and got land and were able to stay, didn't, didn't, were not removed. What, what does the porch refer to? Place. It is a place, and I'm not sure the derivation of porch. There's a creek named Porch. It's a creek, Michael says. Okay. It's confusing because the creek is creek and creek is creek. And so it's <laughs> Porch Creek. Yeah. Creek Porch Creek Creek. Porch Creek Creek. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.